Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Wormtown Studios. What's up, Lance? Hey, how's it going today? Going great today. Good. Yeah, uh, we have a really intriguing episode for our uh, our listening audience today, Lance. It is uh, a very mysterious disappearance out of Texas, a, uh, a man named Brandon Lawson. A very well-known case amongst the uh, citizen detective community, and we have one of Brandon's classmates, a friend of his, Jason Watts, who is the authority, I, I suppose you would say, on uh, the citizen detecting angle. And uh, and he talks to us about uh, a lot of the you know the rumors out there and and some inner workings of the family and what actually might have happened that night. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting interview, and you get to to hear from uh, Jason, someone who knew Brandon firsthand and who works with Brandon's family now in uh, trying to find answers here. So we're gonna play that in just a minute, and also Chloe is on that. So we just want to say thanks to Chloe and Jason for that. Uh, but before we roll the interview, we just wanted to bring up a new project that we're working on with Bruce Maitland, Brianna Maitland's father. Yes, it is called Private Investigations for the Missing. It is a nonprofit that Bruce Maitland set up. There are board members. The board members are comprised of former law enforcement, lawyers, and myself and you. Yeah, we're the media contact for this nonprofit, and uh, not because we're newsmen necessarily in the traditional type, but we can help get the word out with some of these um, missing person cases that this nonprofit is going to work with. Yeah, the other board members, they really serve specific purposes like a lawyer or uh, someone who worked in uh, as like an investments broker, uh, title agents, appraisers, people who, who handle inner workings like that. And we handle things like uh, social media and the website and the GoFundMe. There is a GoFundMe for private investigations for the missing. What this does is raise money to hire private investigators to help families whose loved one is missing or it's an unsolved case. and It's gone cold. Exactly. As, as we know, it goes cold very fast and law enforcement has to move on to other cases. So Brandon Lawson's case and Brianna Maitland's cases are great examples of cases this nonprofit would help. Exactly. So if anybody is interested in this, again, there is a GoFundMe for it. Uh, you can go to investigations for the missing. That's all one word, investigations for the missing dot org. There's a little button there that you can press to uh, be directed to the GoFundMe page. Probably easier than going to GoFundMe. Probably, yeah. And uh, we're also on social media on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we're at PI for the missing, and there will be links in the show notes to all the social pages. But really, you want to go to that website. Keep in mind what the purpose is. We've had Greg Overacker on Crawl Space, and Greg Overacker works with Bruce Maitland for Brianna's disappearance. And it is to hire people like Greg Overacker and Lou Barry, all of these private investigators who want to contribute, they want to help. But, I mean, we live in a reality here that they need to have money to do so. They need to have money to stay at a hotel overnight or perhaps, you know, eat dinner. <laughs> they, yeah. they they need these things in order to sustain. Right. If you're spending your own money doing this stuff, you're going to go broke really quick. You're going to burn out, basically. You're going to work on it for a period of time, and then that's it. But these cases, especially when you're talking about private investigations, you need some continuity. You need some people to work on this for an extended period of time. And so this is what this helps with. Yeah. And if you're hesitant at all, if you think, you know, I'm not sure about this, again, go to the website, check out the board members, and you'll see uh, former law enforcement, lawyers, you and I, which adds more credibility than anything, but I'm just <laughs> kidding. But there's a lot of credible people uh, with a rich history in every aspect needed to make this successful. Yeah, and it's not a fly-by-night thing. This took um, like a year or actually more than a year to put together just paperwork-wise when you're starting a nonprofit. Um, I get the feeling it, it uh, really uh, frustrated Bruce the entire process, but we're finally here to the point where we have this GoFundMe, we have this website, we have the nonprofit technically set up, so now we're uh, asking for donations from the public to help this nonprofit run. Yeah, and it's a it's a small amount of money right now. The goal is ten thousand dollars. 
we'll see what happens. Let's, you know, five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. If you, if you, if you really want to contribute again, just like everybody did with the, with Maura Murray's GoFundMe, that, that, that was amazing. And it continues to be amazing. And we can do the same thing here. Okay. So, uh, thanks for mentioning that Lance. And, uh, so let's play the interview and, uh, we really hope you enjoy hearing from Jason Watts about Brandon Lawson's mysterious disappearance. Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today in the Crawl Space studios with Lance. How's it going, Lance? It's going pretty well. It's a wonderful Saturday afternoon outside, and uh, we're comfortably nestled here in our little black box in the Crawl Space studios. That's right, and we are being joined by Chloe Cantor. What's up, Chloe? Things are great. I'm happy to be in the black box. And we have a very special guest on the line. It is a, uh, a friend of, from, from a lot of the Facebook groups. He is a, uh, a champion for the Brianna Maitland case as well as the Maura Murray case and his old friend Brandon Lawson who went missing about five years ago. How are you, Jason Watts? I am doing spectacular. How are you guys doing? Doing great over here. Doing great. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being one of the most productive members of the online community that that we know. We really appreciate that. Oh well, the the honor is uh, is mine. Uh, uh, thank you guys for you know just allowing me to come on there and 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 try to be you know a good advocate for uh, for these cases. So tell us about the disappearance of Brandon Lawson. Brandon Lawson went uh, missing. Uh, During the overnight hours of August 8th into August 9th of 2013, he lived in San Angelo, Texas with his uh, longtime girlfriend, uh, Ledessa Lofton. They had been together for 10 years. They had uh, three children together. Uh, Brandon had a child from a previous relationship. Uh, So there were times where they had four children at the house. Um, He got into a disagreement with Ledessa on the evening of the 8th, he left the house at 11.54 p.m. He got on Highway 277, headed north out of San Angelo. Uh, just before he reached the town of Bront, Texas, his vehicle ran out of gas. Uh, he called his brother Kyle Lawson for help. And uh, shortly after that, he called uh, 911, which is the infamous call that is all over YouTube. I'm sure you guys have heard it. I'm sure everybody's heard it. The 911 call is at times hard to understand, but uh, from what we can gather, he states that he is being chased into the woods, uh, needs the police, and, uh, you know, the phone call either is dropped or disconnected, and uh, his brother arrived at his truck at the same time as a Co County Sheriff deputy. Kyle tells the officer, Hey, it was my it was my brother's truck. I, I don't know exactly where he is. They keep trying to call him and and at one point very briefly they're able to get him back on the line, but uh all they can really make out him saying is I'm I'm bleeding and the phone call gets dropped and Brandon has not been seen or heard from since. Like you said, there is a lot of um information out there on Brandon. You can find the 911 call on YouTube and there have been other uh, podcasts and a lot of media that have looked into Brandon's case. What brings you so close to this case? What is it about uh, the relationship that you had with Brandon that makes you one of the most um, prolific advocates for the disappearance? Brandon and I attended the same high school. We spoke to each other, you know, when we would see each other and stuff like that. Just one of those people that, uh, always treated me with respect and uh, always had a smile on his face. Real good guy. Uh, he, he, he wasn't the, some of these articles and stuff like that. have kind of tried to paint him as this bad guy or felon on the run just because of certain circumstances. And that's just, that's not true. That's uh, we, we can get into that a little bit, but uh, I was kind of a goofy nerd in high school and I, certainly caught my share of flack for it but uh brandon was one of those guys that always treated me with respect and uh i don't forget that kind of thing so 
uh, a very small reason that I do this is because I want Brandon wherever he is and I want his family to know and I want the public to know he was a respectable guy and uh, he certainly had my respect in return. He, he was a good guy and he certainly does not deserve what's happened to him. Or The uncertainty uh, for sure yeah. is, uh, is awful. Um, so Brandon was 26 when he went missing. He's 5'9", 230 pounds, has brown hair, blue eyes, has multiple tattoos, and uh, was wearing a yellow shirt and camo shorts and white Nike shoes when he went missing from Bronte, Texas on August 9th, 2013. So you mentioned that people tried to paint him as a bad guy. Is that, uh, be- I mean, I'm sure we're going to get into this. Is that because of the, the warrant he had out uh, for his arrest? Uh, yeah, that's part of it. He had a warrant out for his arrest due to a nonviolent drug charge that was years old. You know, he did have a little bit of a past with uh, with some drug issues, but uh, by all recent accounts, he was coming clear of those issues. Uh, he had even passed a drug test the day before he went missing. He was uh, fixing to start a new job. He was uh, he was leaving his current job at Renegade. Uh, oil well services. I'm not sure of the name of the new company that he was due to start the next week, uh, but it was a job where he would have more benefits and more money, and he was wanting to uh, obviously take that avenue to better better provide for his family. Interesting. So even more stress uh, in his life than we realized. This is a guy who had four children that he was supporting, as well as a, a girlfriend and himself. So there are people that think that Brandon possibly escaped from his life and is still out there. What do you have to say to that theory? What evidence do you think speaks for or against it? I highly doubt that Brandon chose to disappear from his life. Uh, Typically, people that are choosing to disappear don't bother to try to start a new job or I would find it hard to believe that he chose to go missing that night while at the same time calling 911 to come assist him, call his brother to come assist him. He did try to call Ladessa and uh, he wasn't able to get through. When Brandon left the house, he took the only wall charger that they had for their cell phones. So the only avenue Ladessa had of charging her phone was uh, to take her phone into her vehicle and plug it into the charger in the vehicle and let it charge. Do we know what the uh, their argument was about, Brandon's and, and Ladessa's argument? From what she's told me, it was just about, you know, the stresses of everyday normal things. You know, couples get into disagreements all the time. You know, you got four kids, you're fixing to start a new job. He's working, she's working. One of their children had been uh, very ill with a you know, double ear infection. He'd been running a fever. I think it was their smallest child. Nobody slept very well in a couple of days trying to care for the sick one. And, uh, you know, that that all adds stress. I ask um, because I had read something on, like, the online community, which is obviously equivalent to a rumor mill. But it, it was out there that he and Ledessa had argued because of a drug relapse that was recent. And he had stayed out late that night. Have you heard that rumor? I know kind of where that rumor came from. Take that with a grain of salt. I, I'm assuming you probably read that article that came out about a month ago. Uh, I don't think the reporter of that article necessarily wanted to deceive anybody, but I, like I said, I take that article with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't think some of that information is just, I don't think it's accurate. That article did present other pieces of information that weren't out there, which makes me, you know, a little bit suspicious Another piece of information that they had released, I believe, was that his brother, Kyle, in recalling their phone calls, not only remembered that Brandon had said, I'm bleeding, but had mentioned that he was being chased by Mexicans. Did you? Uh, Yeah, I personally had never heard that before. And I haven't had the chance to really uh, speak with Kyle to, to, you know, get validity on that. So uh, I, I don't know. Do we know what uh, drugs were the the charges from? Uh, It was, I believe it was possession of a controlled substance, which uh, different states have different, you know, laws and stuff like that. But uh, I don't think he was, you know, 
it wasn't like he was unloading trucks of drugs or anything. Yeah, like that. yeah. No, no. It it's was uh, definitely. It was probably like I think controlled substances, anything like in a measured amount. I guess like maybe a pill or something. Yeah, and not all crimes, you know, are like there's different complexities to situations. It sounds like yeah. from from the charge that it was certainly nonviolent and personal use you know it wasn't like he was dealing drugs or involved no no it doesn't point to any direction like he was involved with a bad crowd necessarily no, not at all okay the controlled substance uh how long ago was this that he had this, that this warrant was from 2005 the warrant was years old and brandon himself did not even know about it until a few months before he went missing Okay. I think that's totally possible too. Yeah. It's this minor thing. It's not something that the cops are, you know, knocking on doors trying to find him about. They're just gonna talk to him if they ever pulled him over for a speeding ticket or something like that. And that's probably kind of how he was proceeding himself. He said, "Okay, it's been so long. They're not actively pursuing me. Maybe he just wasn't interested in necessarily sacrificing his freedom by turning himself in right away." But the whole that whole angle with the active warrant created quite some confusion in this case because I've also yeah. read and you know feel free to confirm or deny this based on your own experiences but Kyle had originally thought that Brandon was hiding from the police because of that warrant and yes. obviously he didn't know that Brandon himself had called 911 and he probably wouldn't have felt that way if he had known that very important piece of information but he thought that at first and I feel like now people think that he's holding things back or that was evidence that Brandon is continuing to hide this day. But in my opinion, he just didn't have all this, the information yet. That is completely my feeling as well. <laughs> so many people have really kind of pointed a bad finger at Kyle and he just, he does not deserve that. Kyle did not know that Brandon was in any kind of real trouble. And as you stated, Kyle thought that Brandon was hiding because of that warrant, and that wasn't the case. I mean, typically a person who's trying to hide from a warrant doesn't call 911 and say, hey, I need the cops. I think based on Kyle's actions that night, he's he's pretty in the clear. I mean, the, the guy couldn't afford uh, to buy gas uh, to help his brother uh, get out of the jam that he was in late at night, and he drove yeah. there uh, hoping to help him with gas and get his truck out of there, and then he was spent all night looking. Like, there's, just, you know, there's, this guy is uh, beyond reproach. Even, you know, the public and even, I think, even law enforcement kind of took that the wrong way because, you know, when Kyle and Deputy Neal arrived at that truck, Kyle and his girlfriend were kind of playing phone tag with Brandon trying to get a hold of him. You know, Kyle didn't tell Deputy Neal, I'm on the phone with my brother, because, like I said, Kyle thought Brandon was hiding. And so every, when, when Kyle didn't tell the deputy that, everybody took that as, oh, my God, you know, Kyle wasn't up front. He's hiding something, blah, 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 blah. And that, that just wasn't the case. Kyle was doing what any brother would have done. So when you said uh, they were able to get him back on the line, are you referring to they being Kyle and his girlfriend? So his girlfriend was yes. with him in the truck? Yes. Okay. And, and they were able to get him back on the line uh, while the trooper was there? Yes, for a brief moment. Yes. Okay, okay. So that night, Brandon calls his father, who lives about a two-hour drive away. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so he calls his father. He calls Ladessa, his girlfriend, a few times, several times. He calls Kyle, his brother, has a couple of calls with him, at least. Yeah. And he calls 911. So he's he's on the phone quite a bit. He's calling at least four yeah. different places. Yeah, he... Uh... When him and Ladessa got into the argument, uh, he called his dad, I think, at about 10.50. And, you know, before he left the house. And oh. he was just like, hey, dad, you know, I'm stressed out. We're arguing. I kind of want to come see you. Uh, I just, you know, kind of want to get out, get away, chill, clear my head. And uh, it, it, it is a far drive. It's actually closer to about a three-hour, I think it's like a three-and-a-half-hour drive. Ah. Brandon's father said, hey, look, it's late. I don't think you really need to be driving out here that late. Why don't you just, you know, go lay down with your son, chill, and you'll hash it out in the morning. I want to get back to the, uh, real quickly, to Kyle and his girlfriend and the officer that was at the scene. And when they got him back on the phone, 
Kyle, was it Kyle's girlfriend that caught, got him back on the phone or was it Kyle? And what was the officer doing while they briefly got him back on the phone? Uh, I think it was Kyle's girlfriend that was that actually got a hold of him because Kyle was talking with the deputy. OK, because he specifically when they when she was able to kind of get him back, he specifically said her name, you know, I think he said her nickname. Her, her name was Audrey. And so he said odd, which is, you know, short for that. He says, odd, I'm, I'm fucking bleeding. And that's when the phone cut out and they weren't ever able to get him back. Now, she did text him uh, after that and say, you know, hey, there's a cop at your truck. And a lot of people think that, you know, she texted him that to kind of warn him to stay away. And, you know, I haven't spoken to her, so I don't know. Maybe she did tell him that to kind of warn him because they thought he was hiding for the war- from the warrant. Or maybe she told him that because, you know, hey, you know, we're all here looking for you. Where are you? Yeah, I, that doesn't really strike me as so odd that you're out there looking for your boyfriend's brother and you just barely get him on the phone. So your next uh, thing to do would be to text him. What, what are you going to text him? Like, we're here and there's a cop here. That just seems pretty normal to me. What is the terrain like there? And what's around there as far as uh, gas stations or any place that he would stop? Uh, it's almost midnight. He must have known that his uh, vehicle was low on gas. Uh, how much gas was in the vehicle? So they're sorry. There are like three questions I just rapid fired <laughs> at you. No, no, it's perfectly fine. And uh, no, it's not. I can I can answer all of those. Uh, the terrain is not friendly, <laughs> to say the least. I don't I don't know if you guys have seen any of the pictures. Yeah. Like even even right there next to where his cross is that marks where his truck found was found. There's cactus everywhere. Now, there are some parts of it that kind of thin out, and it's more grass, but mostly it is very rocky, rocky cactus, thick brush terrain. It's not a place you really want to go running around in the dark. It's pitch black out there. There's no street lights. There's nothing. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Is that public property out there, or uh, what's? how is the ability it's, to search? Uh, it's privately owned land that is mostly leased out for hunters to come hunt on. And how much uh, fuel was in the truck when he left? I don't know, and I don't think Ledessa knows exactly how much gas was in it. I know between San Angelo and Bront, there's nothing. You're not going to find gas. And uh, I know I know a huge point of debate and conjecture is, and is why did he run out of gas? Why did he run out of gas? I can I can tell you why I think exactly why he ran out. He thought he could make it to Braun. I think he got in that truck. He looked at his gas cage and said, yeah, I got to have to make it to Braun. I can make it. You know, people do that all the time. And it was about it was about five miles away, right? Yeah, he was about four, four miles south of Braun, probably about a half a mile before you cross over the Colorado River. Yeah, I, I could see. Uh, I mean, I think we've all had moments where we're running so low on gas and we're like, well, I can get another couple miles. You know? Yeah, you know, I can make it, I can make it, I can make it. Get like 10 miles on fumes. I'm sure you guys probably looked at aerial photos of the area and it seems like a little bit of a distance, you know, but it's really not. From where his cross is to that gas station where he would have stopped, not even five more minutes worth of driving. He was so close to making it to Bront. Do you think that maybe he was uh, attempting to walk there and for some reason ducked off the side of the road? Yeah, that's possible. I mean, it, it it's possible, you know, he pulled over there to the side of the road and called Kyle and decided, hey, I'm just going to walk. He can pick me up off the side of the road. I, I don't know. Personally, I would have stayed with the truck, but I don't know. I mean, without being in that situation, I couldn't tell you exactly what I would have done. Were the hazard lights on on the truck? No, not at first. When the deputy got there, the truck was kind of sticking out in the road just a little bit. And so the concern was that it posed a, you know, a hazard to oncoming traffic. And so when the deputy was there, he opened the door, kind of took a look around inside, turned the flashers on, shut the door and said, "Ah, I'll call a tow truck in the morning. If nobody if nobody's come back for the truck, you know, we'll we'll arrange for a tow in the morning. So the deputy arrived there based on the call from the trucker, and then Kyle and his girlfriend arrived shortly after. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. They both arrived right about one ten. So these phone calls that Kyle and Kyle's girlfriend uh had with Brandon, these these quick calls, um I, I know there was some some service issues. Um, but was he making perfect sense to them? 
As far as I know, yeah, he wasn't, uh, you know, sounding out of it or anything. Was it like, because the only call that we've heard is the 911 call, and uh, there's some of it that sounds like, like uh, you know, he's going somewhere with some of the stuff he's saying, but then it seems to me like it it doesn't, it's not like a, a logical story of, of, uh, of what's really going on to me. Well, I mean, it, it is difficult to understand, and uh, I, I attribute a lot of that to adrenaline and fear. I think when he made that call, he was he was definitely running from someone and he was definitely scared. And that'll make you slur your speech and be hard to understand because you're talking so fast and everything. You know, a lot, a lot of people point to the fact that he's so hard to understand as a automatic sign of relapse. I don't make that connection at all. Uh, I can I think I can make quite a bit of sense of what he's saying. Now, there are parts of that call. I'm just like everybody else. I don't know. Yep. So what do you, what do you make of it then? I, I know that he says he's in the middle of a field, and then he says this guy, um, Staper, just pushed me over or just pushed some guys over. It sounds like, and to me, it it the, that that's the part that I'm talking about that doesn't sound super logical. I know there could be some explanations for it, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, he, I, I, it's kind of hard to. You you guys don't have the nine one one call in front of you, do you? We do. Yeah, we we'll, we'll, we can play it now. Emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the field. The tape was just pushing guys over. Right here going towards the gasoline on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. I've taken the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now, run that. I mean, we're not talking to them. Oh, I saw you ran into them. Ah, you ran into them. Okay. That's the first guy. You need an ambulance? Yes. No, I need the call. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? Was his cell phone, was there a ping or any uh, cell phone activity after uh, that night? No. His la- uh, his phone last pinged when Audrey texted him at 119. And it pinged in an area that was a little bit further north of where his truck was. It pinged in an area kind of right up there by the Colorado River. Was the phone charger that he took from the house in the truck, or did they not find it? I do not have that that information. Uh, it, it probably was in the truck. I don't think I've ever seen an itemized list of what was in the truck. Gotcha. I, I'm not even sure if there is one. L- law enforcement uh, didn't. They seem to feel that he is kind of voluntarily missing. So they didn't treat this as a crime. So, you know, the truck wasn't processed or anything like that. I know Ledessa told me when they uh, impounded it, you know, when they when they towed it off the side of the road, took it to the yard or whatever, that she thinks they did go through it, checking for drugs or anything like that. But other than that, you know, they didn't process the truck for fingerprints or anything like that. Speaking of which, uh, kind of going back to the drug, drug angle a little bit, they did not find any kind of drugs or paraphernalia in that truck. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, so now we're going to slow the speed of this 911 call down a little bit. 911 emergency. Yeah, some of the middle of the field. The tape was Oh, I saw you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him. Okay. That's the first guy. You need an ambulance? Yes. No, I need the call. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? What I hear there is I am in the middle of a field. A word I don't know, you know. A lot of people think it's stranger, staper, whatever. I don't know what that word is. I have, you know, that's that's one thing that is a really hot topic of debate is what he says there. Some people have speculated that the phone call is edited and he says state trooper and it's just been cut and spliced and sounds like staper. I don't know, but he says I am in the middle of a field. A something just pushed some guys over. I just... You know, a lot of people have said that it it sounds like he's saying somebody pulled. I don't hear pulled. I distinctively hear the S-H sound of pushed. 
some guys over. Is there a nickname for state police that's Staper? I know uh, where I grew up, they called state police Stadies, and that was a really uh, quick way to say a state trooper. I would hardly ever hear anyone say uh, a state trooper. They would always say a statey. Is Staper like, have you ever heard that before in, in, in regards to a state trooper? I personally have not. We've always just called them state troopers. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. Or, or state cops. I have never. Yeah. Heard, I know in some parts of the world, as you said, Lance, they call them stateies or something like that. Uh, personally, down here in Texas, just everybody I've always talked to always says state trooper. And there's no other uh, theory as to what that word is, uh, if it is staper. The most common theory is that that that, that call is edited and that he said state trooper, and it's been spliced together and and sounds kind of like staper. I know lots of people have broken down that this call very well at true crime garage they did a really good job of breaking it down they did they did a great job with it they have even stated you know that normally when a phone call is edited or, or two parts of an audio are spliced together there's a distinct popping sound of the two pieces of audio being placed together uh i don't hear that pop there yeah uh so if it is edited if Whoever edited did an extremely good job. Yeah, we edit a lot of audio over here, and I know Captain of uh, True Crime Garage does too. He's worked with it for forever, and it uh, doesn't seem like there's any editing in there um, based on what we've heard. Um, but, I mean, that isn't the only thing that he says that's that doesn't really make sense, right? Right, and you are accurate when you said the, the it's not pulled, it's pushed. You can clearly hear pushed. Yeah. Okay, let's see what else he says. Okay, we're out here going towards Abilene on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here, a guy's chasing me into the woods. Now, we're out here going towards Abilene. We know that's accurate because the road he was on takes you to Abilene. So... That that is what that is. We're out here going towards Abilene. Can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Did does does he say we're out here? As in we are out here? Yes, we're out here. Uh, is that I a, think he's saying we're out here going, or he's either saying we're out here going towards Abilene or right out here going towards Abilene. Okay. Okay. Um, is that a is that a way to refer to oneself as as we're like uh, if someone were to ask me where I'm going and I'm like oh we're going over here in in like that sense instead of saying I was that something that that was typical maybe in that area I mean clearly you know he says somebody just pushed some guys over so that clearly to me he says that there's more than just Brandon out there you know uh, something just pushed some guys over so that that says to me that there's somebody else out there with him you know we're out here going towards Abilene is in Brandon and this this other party and we'll hear this later in the call, but he mentions, I got the first guy, is what I heard. But, you know, we'll hear what you think when we hear it. So that's just, that's another reference of him possibly saying he's not alone. Not being alone and, they, yeah. and, and implying, or saying the first guy implies that there would be maybe a second or third or who knows how many people. When he says we're out here towards going towards Abilene on both sides, now that is the direction he was traveling, right? Towards the town of Abilene? That's correct. After he would have gone through Bront, the next town he would have come to is Abilene, Texas. Okay. But what does what on both sides mean? I don't know if maybe he's, you know, referring to both sides of the road. You know, we're out here going towards both sides, like I'm on one side of the road, they're on the other. Uh, that could be what he means. You know, we're out here going towards Abilene on both sides. And this is like a one lane road. This is like a one lane highway. Each each road is one, each uh, direction. Yeah, each lane is one way. Yeah, two lane okay. highway. One going north, one lane going north, one lane going south. Why would he, and in your opinion, say Abilene and not Bront, if Bront was the closest town? No, that's a good question. I I don't have the answer to that. Uh, a lot of people have suggested that he is trying to say we're out here going towards Abilene on Bront's side. I kind of distinctively hear a TH, both sides. I could be wrong there, and 
but I don't know. And again, when your adrenaline's pumping and you're scared, you're trying to get words out, and uh, you know it's easy to mix them up. But uh, Led- Ledessa reported that he was sober when he left his house, right? Uh, this is something that her and I went over last night. Oh, great. Uh, she, she, and she has told me this before. She said, I did not see him take anything. I did not see him drink anything. I didn't see him have anything on him. I don't want an emergency. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the field. The type was just pushing guys over. Right here going towards the gas went on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. I got to take the woods. Okay. A guy is chasing me into the woods. Please hurry. I'm sure you guys heard right there where he says a guy's chasing me. The sound changes. Okay. I, I think I may know why that happened. And it actually happens again when he is on the phone. I don't think he's necessarily holding the phone up to his ear. I think maybe he has it on speakerphone and you know, how we all are when we are on speakerphone, we have the phone in front of our face. Gotcha. I think when he is talking to her, he is turning his head to look around him. And that's why the sound kind of fades out a little bit. I mean, um, I mean, I'll hold my phone in front of me right now, and I can turn my head. You can hear the sound change. You know, guys chasing me into the woods. That's a good demonstration. And he's turning and then coming back around yeah. towards the phone. I think you're you know, right. I'm you... out here, you know, there's one car here guys chasing me into the woods. I, I did that same action just now. I think this happens again. And, and, and we'll talk about it when you get to it. And it's possible he's also running too because he sounds distinctively out of breath and Tim was just moving his arms like if you're holding the speakerphone and moving your arms back and forth, that'll also interrupt the quality of the um, audio. I have one question about his use of the word woods. Okay. Do you think that there's anything to read into that? Uh, because I, I've been missaying that he walked into, he went into the woods. And then when you look at the, uh, the terrain, it doesn't look like woods. Is that common to call that woods? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, people here in Texas would refer to a lot of thick brush like that as wood. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Now, did he have any enemies that we know of or anything like that? Not to my knowledge. Any uh, Anything suspicious on his cell phone records? Not to my knowledge. Okay, now, run that, but I mean, the more I talk to him, I show you that it's him. Ah, you ran into him, okay. That's the first guy. You need an amulet? This part is kind of, I'm not 100% sure. Because it sounds like he's saying, we're not talking to him. I accidentally ran into him. Now, I can perfectly hear the part where he says, I accidentally ran into him. But when he says, we're not talking to him, you know, without having any more information about exactly what happened, I, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? One kind of theory, well, not really theory, but something that I've kind of wondered is if maybe... And I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm saying this is, it's just, it's just a, you know, completely speculative on my part. But I'm wondering if what caused this whole kind of thing is if, uh, while Brandon's sitting there on the side of the road, maybe a vehicle is coming from the same direction he was. At the same time, a vehicle is coming from the oncoming direction. And since maybe this vehicle coming from the same direction as Brandon was, you know, comes upon his truck and sees it a little crooked swerves and cuts this vehicle coming from the opposite direction off. And that would kind of make sense. Just push some guys over. And I don't know if maybe one of the cars said, ah, oh, the heck with it and left well, the other car, you know, gets out, goes up to Brandon, you know, what the heck are you doing? I almost hit your truck kind of thing. And then a situation ensues and Brandon is forced to flee into the woods to escape. And that's when he, you know, he has to call 911 because he's in such fear for his life. Again, that's completely speculative on my part, but it is something that, uh, that things in the 911 call would kind of support. Right, because what you're doing is trying to make sense of 
one of the last uh, things that he said, and the la- some of the last things that he said could hold the key to uh, the answer here. And you know, by using you know from both sides and pushed, you are I think responsibly trying to come up with the the right scenario that led to him you know not being found at this point. Yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is, we just don't know. But like I said, that 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 is something that you know, with what you have on the nine one one call, would fit. Just an opinion question. Do you think that it's possible that he misheard the operator when she said, run that by me? And then he says, no, we're not talking to, to him or, or whatever that, that was determined that he said. And then he, he sort of corrects himself and says, no, I ran into him. Do you think that he, he misheard her? I, I don't think so, because it almost sounds like he kind of cuts her off. You know, she goes, OK, run that by me one more. And, uh, and she doesn't even really get the word time out, yeah. and he's already started to talk again. Right. That's why I was thinking maybe he mis- misheard her. I, I think he's more so trying to explain what's going on in a really short amount of time. But, I mean, it, it is possible, as you suggested, that maybe he didn't understand her. Okay. Was there any damage found on his car? Absolutely none. Was there any damage found in the road, like any pieces of headlight or anything like that, to your knowledge? Tire marks? There wasn't any, you know car parts or anything like that found on the uh on the road or anything but this is something that uh hasn't really been said before and I, a matter of fact i talked to uh Ledessa about this last night and wanted to make sure she was okay with me saying it there were tire marks kind of by where that truck was now Ledessa seemed to think it may be where he slammed on the brakes and the truck skidded to a stop but we just we just don't know yeah, it sounded like he ran out of gas, right? I wouldn't imagine the skid marks are from him. But uh, but I know that there are skid marks all over the highway. Um, and, yeah. And it's it's really hard to, to narrow down where those uh, came from originally, or even if they were involved in an accident. Yeah. Now, one thing that is, you know, possible is we know that truck was extremely low on gas. Now, I don't know if maybe when he stopped, if he had to stop in a hurry and slam on the brakes, you know, the truck kind of, all the, what little gas was in the tank all, you know how it is. It's just like anything else in the car. You slam on the brakes, everything goes forward, even the contents of the fuel tank. And maybe what little gas was in there kind of sloshed away from the pump of the gas tank and the truck died. That's possible. Not saying that's what happened, but yeah, I don't know. Since there was such low gas in it, he wasn't able to get it to start back up. Ledessa did tell me that when they got that truck out of the impound, they had to put some fuel in it to get it started Stop it. Now, this is another part of the call that's kind of hotly debated. A lot of people think, as Chloe suggested, he's saying, I got the first guy. Some other people think he's saying, they shot the first guy. That's one part where I'm I'm not really sure. For the longest time, I kind of went with maybe he's saying I got the first guy. Now, uh, the second part of that, this is a part where I'm sure you guys have seen is hotly debated, is it's a, whether or not it's another person saying yes when the dispatcher says, do you need an ambulance? And then Brandon's saying, no, I need the cops. Well, that's interesting. Um, I want to, before we get to that, uh, we we can all agree that the words first guy are in there, whether it's yes. shot, yes, not, I do. Yeah. or got. It's really interesting, though, because what is, what is, what's, what's his train of thought at this time? If he yeah, is I running don't... from somebody in the woods, I'm sorry, through through that terrain, if he's running from somebody or or a few people, I mean, saying first guy would indicate that there's multiple guys. And he's he's responding to her saying you ran into them and he says yeah. something the first guy. It's it's uh yeah. so that that indicates multiple people. Yes, exactly. Now after he says I got the first guy or whatever, whatever he's saying, she starts to talk at the same time he does. And they she kind of overlaps him. Now if you play that back, but he's, I think he's saying something about the second guy, but I can't quite make it out because the dispatcher has already started to talk over it. 
Now, moving on to this part where uh, everybody thinks it's somebody else saying yes, and then Brandon says no. I think that is another instance where Brandon is turning his head. And as she asks him this, his head is turned. You know, do you need an ambulance? Yes. No, I need the cops. And that's why that, again, that's why that sound kind of dips out a little bit. I don't know uh, Ladessa's take on the call, but uh, t- again, to me, that that's I think that's what's happening there. You know, he's, he's turning his head and looking, you know. Yes. No, I need the cops. So where we're at right now is that the the police said that uh, he might have run off with another woman, um, but the evidence that we have heard sounds like either he was being chased by at least two men into the woods or perhaps there was some kind of uh, substance involved that got him um, speaking in a, in a way that wasn't uh, so obvious to understand. Yeah, uh, I, I really, to me personally, I don't think it's, I don't think he's under the influence of a substance. I really don't. Nothing, nothing about his actions to me suggests that. I don't really? think that just because he's hard to understand in this call means he's under the uh, influence of a substance. I think the first time I talked to you guys, we talked about how a lot of people have com- compared this 911 call to the call of that couple that was under the influence of, of, methamphetamines and they made their 911 call and a lot of people kind of compare those two calls back to back. Yeah. If if you listen to that call made by that couple, they were saying just some they thought cows were people, they thought cars were up in trees, just stuff that just does not make any kind of worldly sense. Yeah. Uh but to me Brandon doesn't say anything like that. You know, he's not talking about seeing purple elephants or leprechauns or anything like that. He's but if just, if it's oh. true that he said, like, the Mexicans are after me to Kyle, that, that kind of does point to someone that's not aligning with reality. But I guess we need to have that confirmed. Yeah, and unfortunately, we just uh, think we, we, don't, we don't have that. Is Kyle not as open in communicating as Ladessa? You know, I, I, I honestly think that Kyle feels really guilty about what happened that night. I haven't spoken to Kyle much, so I don't know. Uh, but just from what I've seen, I, I think he's, you know, pretty guilt, guilt ridden or not guilt ridden, but you know what I mean? Racked with guilt. Sure. You know, law enforcement grilled that kid pretty hard. You know, they gave him multiple lie detector tests, which he passed. Uh, and I think maybe he feels like, you know, no matter what I say, people aren't going to believe me. So I just I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, right. How far away was the Colorado River from where the uh, cell phone pinged last? Uh, well, the cell phone last pinged in an area up by the Colorado River. It was kind of like right there by it. Now, the truck was about a half a mile south of the river. And how raging is that river at this point or at, at that point in 2013 in uh, August? Well, the Colorado River is not a flowing body of water in that area. It's most it's it's a still standing body of water. Uh, it wouldn't have any kind of movement to it. And I think at that time, uh, it was maybe only about knee deep. Oh wow! So it, it it's not something that you're gonna you know get swept away in or anything like that. And uh, what have the searches been like? Have they they've searched the river? I, I imagine and the surrounding areas. Well, that's uh, that's another big uh, big topic of argument between the family and law enforcement. Uh, you know, when Brandon first went missing, law enforcement uh, focused primarily on the area where the truck was found, and I, and I understand why they did that because you know naturally that's where they're going to go. Is where the truck was found. But uh, the cell phone ping information came out, you know, I don't know exactly how many months after, but it was a few months, maybe like two or three. I don't know. Uh, Latessa would probably be able to better answer that question. Uh, They got that information a little later and law enforcement just kind of took the approach of, well, we think he's missing of his own accord. So. And uh, I think she said they finally did go search it 
But uh, the Coke County Sheriff is, is a very small organization. I think there's only about six officers. So they only sent, to my knowledge, two people out there to search. Now, you're talking about an area that is hundreds, potentially thousands of acres. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to knock these guys, but I don't see how two people are going to be able to effectively search that. Uh, like I mentioned to you, Chloe, when you did your Q&A, uh, you know, the family still feels that that area needs to be searched. Definitely. Has there been any public-led searches? Uh, no, that's another problem. The landowners have kind of refused to let anybody else out there but uh, the sheriff. Okay, and, and that whole surrounding area is, is owned by someone? I remember we were talking about it's privately, uh, owned. privately owned. and Yeah, you can get privately a owned land. I don't know exactly how many people, I think what this has told me in the past two or three, own the land? Uh, own, own that kind of whole area between where his truck was found all the way up into Bront. Are there, what, yeah, this, is it, this is a big area of land that's leased out to hunters. Well, maybe we should get a hunting lease. Yeah, hunting. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> and go search and go search it with as many people as we can round up. So the purpose. Yeah, of the, well, I mean, if if you could find a way to get legally onto the property, sure. But if you, uh, I know the family has asked the sheriff several times, and uh, he says no. But if you're a hunter, you can get onto that property. But if you're trying to search for a, a possibly a body, you can't. You can't get onto that property. That's correct. If you're a hunter, you're and you, and you pay for the lease. You can, All right. you can go out there. Well, we'll we'll put yeah. on we'll slap on our camo and we'll bring yeah. our uh, <laughs> our Daniel Boone plastic uh, rifles, our raccoon caps, and we'll we'll some, pull that lease. Some rattlesnake that, spray. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we'll we'll pull that permit and we'll uh, we'll go onto the property. I mean, really, like uh, we should go to Texas. <laughs> this, I, I feel like this is the unspoken major issue with this case where did the police is, do any helicopter a, searches did they yes uh matter of fact when brandon went missing one of the first things ladessa did was get up in an airplane and and, and fly over the land with but the police said it, it's, it's really hard because you know especially during the hot August time when he went missing, you know, the plane's rocking back and forth a little bit and you're trying to look and, and, and she has taken several aerial photos of, from her searches and, uh, she has those somewhere. Uh, I know she's trying to, to, to get those together so that she can. Was she, let, uh, was she in, in a police aircraft? Was she with the police during no, this? No, this was a privately, this was a privately funded completely by her deal. So the police haven't gone up there with a with a helicopter, and they they have, but they initially didn't. Their initial theory was, oh well, he's just ran off with some girl, you know, blah blah blah. He'll come back, blah blah blah. And so they didn't conduct their first official search until uh, it was almost a week later. And that was the boots on the ground, or a combination of uh, flyovers. I think it was a combination of boots on the ground and aerial, and just a few of these guys. Uh, I don't know exactly how many of them there were. I know uh, uh, Deputy Neal, who arrived on the scene that night, uh, I think he was there. There was an officer from the uh, Texas Rangers organization. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there were a handful of uh, you know, firefighter volunteers and stuff like that that went. Uh, Ledessa would be able to answer that question a little bit better than me. Uh, I know on October 24th of 2013, uh, Sheriff McCutcheon approved a search using ca cadaver dogs and they searched again. They focused on the area where the truck was found. They even ended up extending the search a little bit because one of the dogs did show a little bit of interest in an area to the Northeast, which would be consistent where the cell phone pinged. But the problem is there are wild hogs in that area and the scent of a wild hog, uh, has been reported to throw off cadaver dogs. Is it like a wild hog farm, or is it like a? Well, it's just. I mean, it's 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 uh, natural. Oh. You know, wherever you got a whole lot of open land, you know, you got all kinds of wildlife: snakes, you know, raccoons, all that kind of thing. You got wild hogs and deer and 
you know, probably a bobcat or two. But those particular hogs uh, give off a certain scent to the cadaver dogs that confuses them uh, much different exactly. than the scent of other animals. So that's yeah. a, that's terrible luck right there. Yeah, it is. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, wild hogs will eat human remains. Just wanted to interject here real quick. There is uh, some interesting facts to know about wild boar. And I think during the conversation, Lance, we didn't really follow up too much on wild boar, um, but they are more dangerous than you actually would realize. Exactly. And this is sort of a rare thing that that we're doing right now, which is interjecting in the middle of a pre-recorded uh, interview. Because you and I had this conversation and we were listening back to the interview and we were talking about hunting and because we're from New England, our brains immediately go to deer hunting. Uh, that's just what, what we think of. Not taking into account the significance and the massive amount of wild boars that are not only in Texas, but in that area. And and they, Jason did mention it, and it just sort of went over our head because we're not familiar with that area. And then upon further research, we discovered some pretty interesting facts here about wild boars. So wild boars can weigh up to a staggering 660 pounds and exhibit extremely aggressive and unpredictable behavior. Now, with that said, most wild hogs or boars are around the 300-pound range. But the chances that you're attacked by a wild boar doubles when you're hunting. Uh, them. So, w which tells you that they're smart, they know when they're being hunted, and actually hogs are the fourth most intelligent animal in the world. And they're extremely dangerous. Once the attack happens, it's quick. I, I believe that it's under a minute, or it averages about a minute. Most, yep. Most do, and you can use your imagination on that, but that probably means you've been gored. And... If that hits an artery, you're going to bleed out pretty quick. Uh, they can exhibit aggressive territorial behavior, and uh, especially if one thinks you're attacking their young or, or coming towards their young, or, th again, uh, thinking they're being hunted, they will actually go on the offensive and attack you. Um, and actually, if you just uh, brief Google search, we'll, you'll find how dangerous these are and stories of hunters being chased by them. And they say if you're going to hunt wild boar, make sure to have a tree picked out, one that's at least six feet off the ground that you can climb in a hurry if you're being chased by one. Yeah, there's crazy stories about boars breaking off their tusk as they're trying to uh, smash Shake a tree down. Tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So earlier I mentioned how heavily concentrated Texas is with wild boars. Of the 21 states with any violent incident that's been reported, Texas is number one. 24% of the reported violent incidents involving wild boars comes from Texas. It doubles Florida. And actually, there's only ever been four deaths by wild boar reported in the United States. So that is something to keep in mind. However, uh, most attacks happen when a hunter is solo. And if someone is attacked and killed, obviously, they're not going to report it. So it, I think it's safe to say that that number is a lot higher than four. Now, we're not saying this because we 100% think that Brandon Lawson was attacked and killed by wild boars. It just came up as we were listening to the episode and we started looking at wild boars. And how dangerous they are. And we listened back to the call and I know there's a lot of talk about state police references. Was it state or state police? Like You start getting your conspiracy hat on and you're going into that. If you consider the wild boar angle, it's a very reasonable angle. And it does actually sound like he says there's one boar here. Uh, and I know we we play the clip and, and uh, we talk about it and, and we talk about uh, how it sounds like he says there's one car here. And it kind of sounds like that, too. But I will say you can't really tell which one he says. So let's play that one more time, slow down, and listen as if he might be saying boar and then see what you think. And then we'll resume the conversation with Jason Watts and Chloe. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the field. The tape was just pushing guys over Right here going towards that wind on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one more here and I've taken the woods. Do you know the names of the people that own that land? I do not. I do not have their names. And has the area of the Colorado River been searched? I would assume so. It I 
I think it's been searched a little bit, but I don't think it's been searched extensively. But that's a, well, even when I talked to her last night, she still firmly believes that that area up there by the river is the area that really needs a good search. I just agree. Based on cell phone ping information and stuff like that. I agree. What What do you think it is that is making it so difficult to go into that area to search it for on on law enforcement side? There, as far as like them allowing other people or them themselves. Them. Well, I guess both. both. I guess both. I think that the sheriff feels that there is a liability issue there. He's uh, just judging from I think what he's told Ledessa is you know if somebody goes out there and gets hurt. They could turn around and sue the landowner, but and even Ledessa said I offered them waiver of liabilities, and they still wouldn't go for it. Uh, now, as I said, their their organization is very small, and they only have about six officers. So I don't I don't know if it's a resource issue as to why they haven't spent more time out there. And again, you know, they seem to feel that he's voluntarily missing. So I mean, if that's the stance that they've taken. They're not going to jump up and down to go back out there. Yeah, they're going to consider it uh, sort of a waste of time because they don't think he's there. Exactly. Yeah. And and there is, is no evidence of a crime having been committed. So really their hands are kind of clean of it technically. Yeah. But that's, that's a little confusing to me when you're looking at the transcript of the 911 call. Well, it's also a black eye. You know? Yeah. That's kind of one thing that kind of confuses me is – you know, they seem to feel that he's voluntarily missing. I don't understand how they've come to that conclusion when, you know, he's calling all these people to come to him and he's calling 911. That is, to me, that is not indicative of a person who is trying to voluntarily leave. No, that's that's a horrible uh, conclusion to draw. Right, regardless of what your theory is, whether he might have been under the influence of something or he was legitimately being chased out there, the 911 call you there are clear moments where he he's requesting them to hurry and and yeah. and you know using words like uh like pushed and you know just something that indicates that there was some force that was involved chased chased yeah, yeah and, being chased please hurry also if he did run away then that is actually evidence of a crime because there was a warrant out for his arrest right so yeah. they, so they should yeah. be looking for him if they thought if they think he ran away Again, I don't know. That uh, it's, it's it's a very brain scratching. How how often do you go to the area? I was there in November of 2017, and I went back this past May. Was there a vigil for the uh, five year anniversary? Yes, there was. I attended. What was that like? As with anything like that, uh, you know, there's a little bit of sadness to it. Uh, quite a bit of sadness to it, but uh, I, I think also at the same time, you know, very hopeful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Ledessa spoke, Brandon's father spoke, uh, just they they miss Brandon very, very, very much. And uh, I, I know I've, I've kind of gotten to know Brad Lawson, Brandon's father, a little bit. And, you know, I really, really respect that guy. I really, really like him. That... That whole family is just sweet as could be. His mom is you know, just sweet. You know, his dad's, you know, real nice. Everybody in that family is just, you know, very nice people. Now, a lot of people are looking into this. How do you handle any leads that come in directly to you? Uh, well, so far, no, no, nobody's really <laughs> come to me with anything. But if they do, I, I will happily pass that on to the proper channels where should they uh who should they contact if they have some information uh they can message the help find brandon lawson facebook page uh they can call crime stoppers they can call the co county sheriff and speak to wayne mccutcheon uh they can message ledessa uh you know those they can you know, you can, you can, there's, there's a thousand avenues to get that information passed, uh, passed on to, uh, you know, the proper people. I've got a phone number right here for the Texas Department of Public Safety at 512-424-5074. And Brandon Lawson's disappearance is case number, Amazon Mary 130880. 
zero zero five. Sucks to amount, uh, you know, a, a person's disappearance, someone that you knew personally, to uh, a number. number. Yeah, but um, unfortunately, that's that's uh, where we're at right now. How are you feeling? I, I just, uh, you know, there's so much rumor and so much speculation and a lot of misinformation that it's all kind of clouded things. I mean, it's just it's kind of like Maura Murray's case. You know, there's a lot of it, it's all rabbit holes. Everybody went down that really they turned out to be nothing. You know, yeah. for exa- for example, the rag and the tailpipe. People went back and forth on that for years. And then, you know, once you guys did your oxygen series thing, you know, it, you know, Fred told her, hey, I told her to put it there. So, and, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that everybody went around circles and it's nothing. And unfortunately, you know, it took time away from other things. Yeah. And this, this one, this one becomes even more intriguing because you have that 911 call and because you have really constant communication up until the very last moment. And that leads to so much speculation and, uh, and, and a lot of, a uh, lot of muddying of the water. Um, and it's, you know. Unfortunately, I just wish that there would be more more of an effort to get on that property and and look. It, I feel like there's a lot of stuff there that can lead to answers. Yeah, uh, I I know it, it's not from a, it's. I don't think it's a lack of uh, effort on the families, and they definitely want to get back out there. And sure, uh, I know Ladessa is, is is still trying to uh, organize perhaps drones to come out there. And search for the drones. Idea. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, you know, if, if, if they're able to to locate something of interest, you know, they can take that to Sheriff McCutcheon and he will act on that. Yeah. One one big uh, rumor that I wanted to shut down right here, Brandon, you know, he was fixing to start that new job. And uh, he tried to cash out his 401k. When people have seen that, they've they've thought, oh, my, you know, he's cashing out his 401k. He's, He's taking money. He's hitting. You know, they use that as a support for the fact that he was going to run away, or the theory that he ran away. I wanted to kind of shut that down because because of that. Uh, that that four hundred one k. The the reason he was taking that out was because he when he started this new job, he wanted to be able to take the four hundred one k from the previous job and you know put it into like an IRA account, you know, to where it would, I don't, I don't know how that whole process works, but I guess keep accruing. Sure. And he could take the 401k from the new job, put it with 401k from the old job, you know, and have himself a pretty good retirement when he chose to retire. And, uh, the, the amount of money, uh, from that was not a real giant big amount. Uh, I, I don't know the exact amount, but it, it was, a, uh, it was less than a thousand dollars. So you know, a lot of people, even even this article, you know, kind of uh, that just came out, kind of hinted at that a little bit, and it's just it's just not the case. But it's a moot point uh, because it's not like he accessed it. It's not like he, yeah, you know, would, did did he get that money transferred to his bank account? They don't know. Okay, well, either way, it's nine hundred dollars. It doesn't. Yeah, it's kind of a moot point. Yeah, uh, and even his boss, where he was working at the time, said uh, he thought he knew Brandon was thinking about doing that, but he doesn't know that he actually did it. Still, like people, people cash out their four hundred one k all the time. You're talking about a guy who was in between jobs with four kids, and it's it's his right to cash out his four hundred one k if he wants to have a little extra cash in between his paychecks. Exactly, and uh, I, I know his last paycheck from his. The job that he was working, it, it it went into his account that Friday morning. That money was never touched. Right. It actually ended up eventually going over to the state to cover, you know, the child support that he, uh, you know, owed on the that he was paying on the first child. Uh, it, there has been no activity on his cell phone, no activity on his bank account. There has not been any credible sighting of him, and there hasn't been any contact from him to his family. Yeah. Again, regardless of what brought him there and whether or not he was under the influence of something, that's very telling that he had his paycheck deposited into his bank account that morning. And then to say that he voluntarily disappeared is sort of ludicrous. Uh, this is the this is the most successful disappearance with no planning I've ever heard of. Or resources. He had no he didn't have his vehicle. and He did have access to money, but didn't use it. How could you possibly start exactly. over that way? I mean, you could tell. 
look at those pictures. He loved his family. And he, he adored his children. I, I just, the theory of him voluntarily choosing to leave his life does not make sense to me. And like I said, there's so many theories and so much misinformation. You know, a lot of people have pointed the finger at Kyle. Uh, a lot of people have grilled Ledessa pretty good. She did. That poor girl, she didn't do anything to, to deserve that. I've really hated, you know, watching people go after her. She, that's just completely unwarranted. I mean, I'm sure if you guys, you know, go on web sleuths and Reddit and stuff like that here sometime in the past couple of days, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they try to point to the fact that she didn't go out there that night as her being involved somehow. Which is with four ludicrous. children? <laughs> yeah. What was she going to do with the four yeah, kids? Yeah, please. Well, I mean, she had three small children there at the house. One of them was sick. You're not going to get that sick baby out in the middle of the night and go to the middle of nowhere when you're the guy who's practically your brother-in-law is saying, Hey, you know, I'll go take him to gas, just leave me the gas cans. You know, I'll go do it. Yeah. It's unfortunately, it's really easy for people to just read the Wikipedia and then a couple of, uh, you know, arbitrary articles about it. And then they start, their brains start putting things together and, you know, you, you stew on stuff like that for too long. And all of a sudden, you start yeah. reaching out to the ex girlfriend. You start reaching out to the current girlfriend, the brother, his girl. You know, you just start reaching out to these people, and a no comment suddenly turns into they're guilty. Uh, also, people hey, don't they they have exactly. this like um, hindsight is twenty twenty thing. Uh, if if there's no way to know that someone yeah. would would be missing for so long, if she knew that at the time, I'm sure she would have grabbed the kids and threw them in the car and said, "We're going to go look for them." I mean, you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a little bit of the pile on uh yeah. thing on online on Reddit and uh web sleuths and, and stuff like that. It's kinda natural, I think, uh when, yeah. when people well, are doing that. And you know, some of those people I, I think do have, you know, genuinely good intentions, but uh it's like anything else. And Chloe, I know you're in psychology, you could probably speak to this a little bit. Some people when when their mind just cannot deviate from anything but the most of juiciest and dramatic of stories. You know what I mean? They see something like this and in their mind, it's not good enough of a story that he just left the house and something happened to him. And, you know, there's got to be more to it than that. I've seen people just attack Odessa horribly. It's just not fair to her. She got the ball rolling on trying to find him way before law enforcement did. She's one tough lady. Yeah, it sounds like uh, it sounds like his whole family are. You are as well. Not a tough lady. You're a tough gentleman. Uh, and <laughs> you've been doing a great job with all this. And thank you very much for uh, talking with us about this. And, you know, keep keep fighting for this and let us know if there's any uh, developments. And we're happy to have you on at any time. I, I just want everybody to know, you know, did Brandon have his share of issues? Everybody does. But he he was not this evil, drug-hooked, felon-on-the-run bad guy that some people have tried to portray him out to be. He, he, was a, he was a husband, he was a son, a father, a brother, and he does not deserve to be laying out somewhere like that and just ignored because of a past issue that he might have had. Ledessa did not deserve to to lose her her soulmate, the father of her children, and you know her life partner. Brad and Kim Lawson don't deserve to go to bed every night haunted because they don't know where their son is. And Brad has told me, if I never learn what happened that night, I can live with that, but I cannot live with not having my son or knowing where he is. 